Well, good morning. Good morning. We are in for a real treat this morning as we continue uh, our series in January in Honest to God, uh, as we reflect on what it means just to be uh, closer and more intimate and more honest in our relationship with God in these, in these weeks. Uh, we want to welcome our friend of the Meeting House, uh, Ken Shigematsu, to our teaching um, this morning. Yeah, let's welcome Ken. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Ken has been with us before, and you'll realize he has such a, a meaningful and engaging ministry, teaching ministry, and we just really feel that he is a, a true friend and brother uh, coming from Vancouver, where he's uh, been the senior pastor of the 10th Street Church there for over 20 years, um, and 10th Street is one of the largest, most diverse churches in uh, the city center in Canada, and so we're really blessed to have Ken with us. He's also the author of two books. Uh, and he'll be talking a little bit about his most recent book in his teaching time. Prior to being a senior pastor, uh, Ken was a part of the corporate world uh, with Sony Corporation uh, in the country of Japan. So thank you for being with us this morning, Ken, and God bless you as you share today. Great. Thank you, Daryl. Let's welcome thank again, you. Ken. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be back at the Meeting House. One of the excellent comments or very meaningful compliments that I've received as a pastor of 10th Church is that we are kind of a long lost cousin to the meeting house. So any association that we can have with you is really great for us. Love the creative, beautiful ways in which you present the love of Jesus to folks here in Ontario and around the world. I was raised primarily here in Canada, but I was actually born in Japan. And I ended up marrying a woman from Japan, and so I'm back on a fairly regular basis. And when I'm back, I sometimes wonder to myself, what would my life have been like if we hadn't moved away from Japan when I was so young? What if I had actually been not just born in Japan, but raised here? And I think about the enormous pressure there would have been on me to get into the right preschool. And, and then the tremendous pressure for me to pass the exam to get into the right kindergarten. 
And eventually the great pressure to get into the right university and then to be picked up by the right company and so forth. And so I breathe this sigh of relief as I think, thank God I wasn't raised in such a relentless rat race. But if I'm honest with myself, and I know that we're in a series about being honest with ourselves and with God, I haven't escaped the pressure to achieve here in Canada. When I was younger, I felt the pressure to achieve in sports and in school, and then I felt the pressure to achieve in the corporate world, and I even have felt the pressure to achieve as a pastor, which some of you regard as a less competitive, quote, more spiritual kind of vocation. Now, ambition is a good thing, but when we feel the pressure to achieve in order to prove that we are somehow enough, then life can begin to feel like a burden. And if you've ever felt the burden to achieve at school, work, in a relationship, or in some other sphere of life, then Jesus has some very good news for us at the beginning of this year. He says to us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, these words. He offers this promise. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray together. Perfect and loving God, our Father, through the generous work of the Holy Spirit, help us to wear the yoke that Jesus has uniquely crafted for us so that we might live light and free. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So in this message, I want us to explore what it looks like to live a life of achievement and significant contribution that doesn't arise from this anxious need to prove that we are enough in our own eyes or in the eyes of someone else, but that springs from a place of inner rest and gratitude that comes from knowing that we are already accepted and in fact cherished by the one who matters most. I want us to explore two or three practices that help to awaken us to a fresh sense that we are loved by our maker. The psalmist says, and I know you're going through the psalms right now, how priceless is God's unfailing love. And I want us to learn to live in the refuge that comes from being under the wings of God's love. It changes the way we move through the world. And so Jesus here says to you and to me, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you. How so? He says, by taking my yoke upon you. Now when Jesus says, I will give you rest by placing my yoke upon you, I hope it's obvious enough that Jesus here is not referring to a yellow egg yoke. That would be kind of messy. Jesus is referring, when he uses the word yoke, to a wooden bar that is placed across the back of the neck of an ox, enabling it to more easily carry a heavy load. And so here, Jesus is comparing you and me to an ox. It's, it's not particularly flattering. <laughs> if we're from Canada, we would probably prefer to be compared to a beaver, <laughs> an industrious beaver. People from Ontario work very hard. It's our national animal, of course. If you're visiting from the United States, maybe you're up from Florida for a couple of weeks to warm up. Maybe you would prefer to be compared to a soaring eagle. But Jesus here doesn't compare us to a beaver nor an eagle, but to an ox. It's not very flattering, but it is apt because like an ox, we are weighted down by all kinds of burdens and worries. Now Jesus' original hearers in the first century 
would have been hearing these words and they would have felt weighted down by things like, will I have enough money to feed my family in the coming week? They were living in this farming-based subsistence economy day to day. The parents would have had worries about the health of their children in a first century world where most newborns did not live to see the age of 20. Now today, we still have concerns about finances and the well-being of our loved ones, but we also carry a burden that people in the first century did not feel as heavily. We can feel the burden of whether we are doing enough, whether we are accomplishing enough, whether we are enough. And people in Jesus' day would not have felt this burden as heavily because they were living in a time when your place in life was largely determined by the family you were born into and your social circumstances. We live in a day with cell phones and all kinds of technology. (laughs) with opportunities to network and to rise professionally and socially. Those are great things. But what if in this context we don't become really successful? What if we don't become the people that, the person that others or we ourselves projected we would one day become? Then we can feel like a failure. And so if you have ever felt the weight of needing to do something, to achieve something, to be enough, then this invitation from Jesus is for you. He says to you, come, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. How so? He says by taking my yoke upon you. Now, some of you here are saying, in order for me to rest, I don't need a yoke. I need a massage. I need to spend some time at the spa. Or as the weather gets colder, I need an all-expense-paid vacation to the Caribbean. Someone over here almost said amen. (laughs) But Jesus says, no, if you want to rest, deeply in your body and in your soul, you need to wear my yoke. Why? Because he says, we're wearing the wrong yokes, yokes that weight us down, yokes that don't fit us very well, yokes that chafe against the back of our neck. And some of the heaviest yokes of all are the yokes of people's expectations. And perhaps the heaviest yoke of all, for many of us, is the yoke of our own self-expectation. And I know about that, as I mentioned, when I was younger, I felt the pressure to achieve in sports and in school, and then later, pressure to achieve at work. And when I was a single person, I even felt the pressure to be with the right romantic partner to bolster up my sagging self-esteem. And we can get trapped into an if-then kind of thinking. If only I can do this, then I'll feel better about myself. If only I can get admitted to the right school, then I'll feel okay about myself. Or if only I can be hired by the right company or organization, I will feel better about me. Or if only I can finally buy a house here in Ontario, I will feel all grown up. But according to Sean Acor, a psychologist who teaches at Harvard, this if-then kind of thinking cannot be supported by science because every time we achieve a goal, our brain moves the goalposts of what success looks like. So you get admitted to the right school, now you've gotta get good grades. You get hired by the right company, now you need to stand out in the company. You're finally able to buy a house, now you want a larger house or a house in a better neighborhood. Our sense of being enough is not something that we achieve, it's something that we receive. Have you ever seen the movie Cool Runnings? Some of you have seen it, (laughs) obviously. Definitely someone over there. (sighs) Cool Runnings is loosely based on the true story of Jamaica trying to field 
its first ever bobsledding team at the Winter Olympic Games in Calgary in 1988. They were the ultimate underdog. And in one scene in the movie, the coach who's won two gold medals walks into a room where his star bobsledder, Darius, is carefully studying the bobsled course. Darius feels the weight of the world upon his shoulders because he feels that if he can only win a gold medal at these Olympic Games, he'll finally be seen as successful, that people will finally respect him. And the coach walks into this room and he sees all this pressure on Darius. And the coach, as I said, has won two gold medals himself, looks at Darius and says, Darius, winning a gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without the gold medal, you won't be enough with it. And if we're not enough without the gold medal, whatever the gold medal represents for us, we won't be enough with it. Because our sense of being enough is not something that we achieve, it's something we receive. It's not something that we grasp, it's something we're gifted with. It's not something that we create, it's something that is conferred upon us by another. And Jesus says, if you are burdened and weary in some way, take my yoke upon you and you will experience deep rest in your body and in your soul. What does Jesus mean when he uses the word yoke? It's not immediately clear in verse 29 what yoke refers to. And when a word in the Bible isn't clear, one of the best ways to discover its meaning is by looking at the larger context. You scroll back four or five verses and you see that Jesus is just celebrating, rejoicing in the wonder of his love relationship with his perfect father in heaven. He's saying, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have revealed your truth, not so much to the best and the brightest, but to children and to those who approach you with the humility of a child. And Jesus is just basking in the wonder of the Father's perfect love for him. Daryl Johnson is a New Testament scholar and pastor, and he points out that the yoke that Jesus wants us to wear is the yoke that Jesus himself wore. And the yoke that Jesus himself wore is the yoke of his perfect father's unique love for him. And so the yoke that Jesus wants you to wear is the yoke of the heavenly father's unique love for you. And in the Psalms, we're told that our father in heaven is perfect, that in Psalm 103, he is slow to anger and abounding in love. And it makes a huge difference for us to walk through the world with the yoke of the Father's love on our shoulders. It changes the way we travel through life, as simple as it sounds. You know, a number of years ago, I was back in Japan and I was involved in a very personal conversation with a close friend of mine from Japan. He was going through a personal issue. And partway through the conversation, the name of his friend from his university day, Sakiko, came up. And we were being very honest with each other and I said, you know, I've always liked, liked her. My friend says, well, she's still single and beautiful you should get back in touch with her. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not here to socialize. And he said, yeah, you should, you should call her. She remembers you, she asks about you, she had a good impression about you. And so he being his, dialing his phone and I'm like, I, no, I, I, I don't, I'm not ready to talk, I don't know what to say. The phone's ringing, puts the phone in my hand and I'm like, she answers and I'm like, hi, <laughs> hello. Yeah, this is Ken. And she asks, are you the guy who went to Berkeley? I was like, no, that was Jeff. <laughs> she had no idea who I was. And so I say, um, I'm not sure if you have any plans tomorrow afternoon, but would you like to go out for coffee with me? She says, no, I, I, I do have plans. I don't know what came over me, but I said, I don't know what your plans are, but could you change your plans? 
I wasn't thinking about this consciously at the time, but later I realized that in J- Japan, in Japanese culture, it's very difficult for a person to say no. <laughs> Especially no twice, so the cultural norms were working in my favor. <laughs> the Bible says all things work together for good. <laughs> Not referring to that, but. Coffee didn't go so well, but we did get married. <laughs> Not then and there. Uh, that's not the point of the, the story. The point is this. You wouldn't know this about me, but by nature, I am terrified of rejection, especially rejection in romantic pursuit. And so as I look back, I've asked myself, how was it that a person such as me who's so afraid of rejection was willing to put himself out in a place where I could have been humiliated and painfully rejected. And I think the answer is, part of the answer at least is, that I was slowly learning to wear the yoke of the Father's love on my shoulders. And when you wear the yoke of the Father's love on your shoulders, you're more willing to take a risk in a relationship, in some other kind of venture, to face the possibility of rejection and failure because you know that you're loved by the one who matters most and when you really know that, you just become a little bit more bold, a bit more confident, a little bit more willing to face the possibility of failure because you know you're already accepted. Wearing the yoke of the Father's love on your shoulders will change the way you walk through life. And as Daryl alluded to, I've recently written a book called Survival Guide for the Soul how to flourish spiritually in a world that pressures us to achieve. And in this book, I unpack some of the spiritual practices, what I call survival habits of the soul, that help us live with a sense of the Father's love on our shoulders. As you might be able to tell, I'm a very easily distracted kind of person. At any given time, I can feel like there are 127 chimpanzees jumping around in my head. And so at some point in the morning, I'll simply take some time to sit and to breathe deeply. Breathing in through my nose, breathing out. Breathing in deeply, breathing out slowly. And then I'll start to wonder, how much time has gone by anyway? So I'll reach for my phone, not to check my messages, but to open up a free app called Centering Prayer. I prefer these free ones, and there's a timer here. So I'll set the timer for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. A chime will sound as though I were in a monastery being summoned to pray. And I'll continue breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. And then I'll start to think of all the things I ought to be doing my to-do list. (laughs) And so I reach for my Bible, or maybe a passage that I'm familiar with, and every time I'm distracted, I'll simply repeat the words of scripture. Be still and know that I am God. Breathing in. Be still and know that I am God. To change the scenery just for a moment, I'm from Vancouver. I love being on the water. I don't own a sailboat but have friends who do. And there have been times when I've been out at sea and I've seen salmon jumping out of the water at a 45 degree angle. Other rare occasions when I've been out on the ocean and I've seen pods of dolphins. Even more rare occasions where I've seen a couple of whales. There have been times when I've been sitting in God's presence and I feel surrounded by this beautiful mystery that upholds me and the whole world. Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence and eternal pleasures evermore. 
There have been other times when I've been out at sea and I've seen a styrofoam cup discarded and floating on top of the water, a film of oil, some debris. And there have been times when I'm sitting in God's presence, just breathing deeply, and I feel anxiety spike up inside me, or anger, or a painful memory, or a feeling of envy, and I lift these up to God, and I feel free of them, I feel lighter, I feel purged. I continue breathing deeply. And after 15 or 20 minutes, the chime sounds. I'm done. And when I'm done, I I usually feel just a bit more relaxed and throughout the day, just a bit more focused and aware of God's love for me. Silent meditation is a survival habit of my soul that helps me wear the yoke of the Father's love on my shoulders. The scripture tells us whoever rests in the shadow of God, the shadow of the Almighty will rest in his presence, will rest in the shadow of God's wings. Another practice that I do in the evening is to pray a prayer of gratitude. I open up another free app called Reimagining the Examine. And this 500 year old prayer invites me. I'm not sure if you can hear, there's usually music. This, right now, it's this rain came up, reminding me of my city of Vancouver. <laughs> it invites me to look back over the last 24 hours or so and to give thanks for two or three things that felt like gifts from God. And so if I were to do this right now, I would think, well, yesterday after arriving here, I had a great Thai dinner with a couple of new friends in the area. I was able to go for a swim after dinner, obviously in an indoor pool, (laughs) not in the lake. And, and then right now I get to be with you, which, is, which feels like a great gift, being with you. I love this place, I love you all, the, the folks, the good folks here at the Meeting House. And I know that this sounds really simple, but the data shows that if we spend three or four minutes identifying two or three things that felt like gifts from God from across our day, it will actually change the way we travel through life. I've got a colleague who's been in the market for an Austin Mini Cooper, And so in our city of Vancouver, she sees Austin Mini Coopers everywhere. It's not like there are more of these cars on the streets now, it's just that it seems like there are more because she is primed to notice them. And when you take three or four minutes to identify two or three things that felt like gifts from God in your day, it will seem like more good things are coming into your life and that may not necessarily be the case, but it will seem that way. And when you associate these good gifts with God's love for you, you wear the yoke of the Father's love on your shoulders and it will change the way you move through the world. David prayed in Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Another survival habit of the soul that helps me wear the yoke of the Father's love is Sabbath. And Sabbath is an especially life-giving practice, taking 24 hours to rest if you tend to be a workaholic. And you don't necessarily need to be Asian to be a workaholic. (laughs) You just need to be from Ontario. I know you work very hard here. And part of what Sabbath does is that it reminds us that our primary identity doesn't come from what we produce from our making bricks for Pharaoh, but from the sheer glorious fact that we are a daughter or a son of God. We've got a 10 year old son named Joey. Our son Joey is not very productive. He loves to play, he doesn't like to clean up. He doesn't earn any money for our household economy. But he loves money. Recently at his 10th birthday party, he opened up a card from one of his his, uh, classmates and uh, a bill wafted out, like a, a cash bill, and he looked at his classmate and he said, thank you, 
I love cash. <laughs> so he loves money but doesn't make any. And he's kind of rowdy and rambunctious. And so a couple of years ago, he was getting kicked out of class a lot with some other rowdy boys. But we don't love Joey because he is productive, because he earns money for our household, because he's doing well at school or not so much. We love our son Joey because he's breathing, because he's alive, because he's our boy. And God doesn't love you because of what you do, because of how productive you are. He loves you because you are his boy, because you are his girl. And Sabbath helps us to wear the yoke of the Father's love on our shoulders. As the psalmist says in Psalm 103, we have a Father who is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love. As I mentioned, I've recently written this book called Survival Guide for the Soul, How to Flourish Spiritually in a World that Pressures Us to Achieve. This book is available online through Amazon. The Audible edition, the audio edition is free if you're not an Audible member, as a trial offer. And no matter where you pick up this book, 100% of all the net proceeds will go to World Vision and to missions that work with vulnerable children. And so we were very grateful when we were able to give $300,000 away from our first book to our mission partners in Cambodia that work with orphans and vulnerable kids. And this book is opened as a number one bestseller, so we're thankful for that. Let me close with, with this story. When I was making the transition from the corporate world to the world of pastoring, I enrolled in something called the Arrow Leadership Program, founded by Leighton Ford, who is a Christian leader from here in Ontario originally, and is the brother-in-law to the late Billy Graham. When we first came together as an Arrow class, 20 or 25 of us, someone later said that we were like fighter pilots in the movie Top Gun, we were sort of sizing up our rivals. And I was the youngest person or one of the youngest in the class, the least accomplished in Christian ministry. So I was so eager to impress the founder, Dr. Leighton Ford. And in one of our classes, I remember raising my hand real high and I was able to summarize an obscure book written by an MIT professor. I was trying to really wow Leighton. But I stumbled as a young minister. I got into a conflict with someone I was working with because of my immaturity and lack of character. I was in a dating relationship where we were struggling to maintain certain boundaries. And as I failed, this is what I discovered, that Leighton's acceptance of me wasn't dependent on my performance or my capacity to contribute to his organization. 20, 25 years later, we're now close friends and I feel more comfortable in my skin with Leighton than ever before. And it's, you know, he he loves me for no particular reason. And it's not that I, I no longer wanna make something out of my life and ministry in part to honor his investment in me, but it no longer arises from this desperate need to be accepted and validated by him because I already am. It springs from a place of restful gratitude. And this is what I want for you as well. I want you to go for it. I want you to give your best to God and to life, but not out of an anxious need to prove that you are enough but out of a place of inner rest and gratitude that comes from knowing that you are already enough in the eyes of the one who matters most. In fact, you are cherished by the one who matters most. And when you know that deeply, you can live from a place of inner rest and gratitude even as you give your best. Let's pray together. If you're here, and maybe as I talk about being a daughter or a son of God, part of the family of God, you don't relate. I want you to know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the unique son of God, after having lived a perfect life, 
voluntarily died on a Roman cross, absorbing your sins and shame into himself so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be offered a new start with God. And if you want, in your heart, you can say to God, you can pray, God, I don't understand it all, but would you forgive my sins? Would you receive me as your daughter, as your son? And he will bring you into his family and you can experience God's perfect love for you. You can pray that now in your heart if you want. God, take me as your child. And if you're praying that or if you've offered your life to God in the past, hear these words of Jesus to you. He says to you, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. And if you want, you can say, Jesus, please place the yoke of your Father's perfect love for me, that unique yoke, please place it on my shoulders now. I receive it. And this is a yoke that will not weigh you down, but it will lift you up. It will make you lighter and freer. And so through the love of God the Father and the friendship of Jesus Christ and the grace and the presence of the Spirit, may you live light and free now and forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.